You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today, guys, we have a... uh, I'm going to set the scene here because back in the day when I was a wee lad, I didn't grow up in the country uh, of the wild west of Loudoun County. I grew up in Vienna, Virginia, and fishing wasn't a big thing. And then I went to this neat little thing that was at Fairfax, which was Fairfax Lake or Fairfax Pond, depending on what you define as a lake or a pond. And and this gentleman here and his organization put on a fishing tournament. And I learned two things that day. I didn't like cardio (laughs) from having to run back and forth on the lake. And I loved fishing. I had a blast with it. And then you know, jump in time to when I was old enough or crazy enough to actually drive a boat. And I joined the New Horizon Bass Club for a little bit. Um, And his fishing reports have been a standstill. He is the godfather of the area. Charlie, I thank you so much for being here, sir. This is, this is an honor. It's a pleasure. Like I reading through just a little bit of your bio and everything. I I didn't know where I wanted to start. And I realized I just want to at least start from the beginning of you know, what got you into fishing and to tell like the world exactly like how, how you built this amazing legacy in this area. By accident, really. <laughs> <laughs> I was a supervisor for Seven Eleven, And as a result, I have to visit various stores every day. And in visiting one particular store in Sterling Park, the manager told me I was stressed out and I needed a hobby that I really ought to take up fishing. (laughs) So I told him, of course, that visiting the stores every day, I couldn't get off work. Well, as he said, anytime you do get off work, I'll be happy to take you fishing. Well, Rufus was at that time probably in his early 70s. Been fishing all his life from the back hills of West Virginia, one leg shorter than the other. (laughs) But uh, as luck would have it, I managed to get off on Memorial Day weekend, spent Saturday and Sunday with the family, and Rufus took me fishing on Sunday, uh, Monday. Took me down to a little tidal creek off the lower Potomac. We wrestled his 14-foot John boat off the top of his truck down a 12-foot embankment to the base, uh, put all the gear in the boat, and then he pulled out an umbrella net and proceeded to teach me how to catch minnows. He unfurled the uh, umbrella net. Then he took his rod and put a spinner on it cast out next to a bridge piling and caught a small white perch. Took his filleting knife and scored both sides of the perch, put it back on the hook, threw it back out to the bridge piling and very gently brought it in with a crab following it. Wow. Told me to net the crab. (laughs) So I netted the crab. He put it in the middle of the net, smashed it with a rock, picked up the pole attached to the net and dropped the net next to the pilings. Five minutes later, he had 200 minnows in the net. Wow. Which we dumped into the minnow bucket, put it in the boat, and off we went paddling the three miles back to where we had to go. And the creek was so shallow that uh, you had to go in on the high tide and come out on the high tide because there was a flat that was totally out of the water (laughs) in between. But we got back there and we were fishing strictly with the minnows under a bobber. And we caught, between the two of us, we caught over a hundred fish that day. White, yellow perch, pickerel, uh, bluegill, crappie, and one bass. (laughs) Wow. The last fish of the day. I was not impressed with the whole day. I mean, today, this would have been the greatest day of my life because we had nine citation yellow perch. That's over two pounds. Wow. We had probably 15 white perch over a pound citations. 
We had a number of crappie over a pound, bluegill to three quarters of a pound. All the pickerel were hammer handles. But uh, the last fish of the day, he asked me to cast under the single dock in the back of the creek. And I cast under there and caught a pound and a half bass. And that bass pulled enough to get my interest to come back another day. Probably two or three weeks later, we went back again. And in the meantime, like every other budding fisherman, I went into the local sports store and bought a six foot spinning rod, <laughs> and, uh, a Mitchell 300 reel, a spool of line and some lures. When we got back out there this time, he decided to fish artificials along a marsh grass bank. And I was uh, throwing a MEPS black spinner, black fury. <laughs> After, I don't know, five minutes or so of casting, I'm impatient. What am I doing wrong? And Rufus says, slow it down just a little bit. And within 15 seconds of casting and retrieving it a little bit slower, my rod tip was on the other side of the boat underneath it with a fish just pulling as hard as he could. My reaction was, Rufus, what in the hell has got hold of me? <laughs> and it was a citation pickerel. I have no idea how heavy it was, but that fish turned me on for life. It's crazy that we all have a memory of that one fish that we could we can trace back to and be like, that is the one that just got me hooked. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. and for you, like what it did, and it got we're gonna get into it here, but like it's crazy to think now what that fish did and, right. and what's going on now. Like so so from that one fish, like I mean, tell like how did you get into the bass fishing part of things and how did that evolve and grow? Actually, <laughs> Uh, Rufus continued my education by taking me to a local creek and fishing live minnows for crappie. Well, sometimes the crappie were a little bit too slow to bite, and the smallmouth and largemouth grabbed it and said, well, I was all in favor of that, but I, I didn't concentrate on that. I just I kept fishing with Rufus, period. And then I decided that uh, I'd branch out and started fishing the D.C. sector. Uh, I'd take my little 14-foot John boat that I bought down to the foot of one of the main streets in Alexandria beyond the roller rink hmm. that was capped at the edge of the river. Okay, I know the general. And I yeah. drop it in the water right there, and uh, just I had a five horsepower outboard, and ran it up to the Alexandria power plant, where I decided to fish for white perch and catfish. Mm. And based on my success there with catfish, I decided to be a catfish guide. Really. And uh, I was very lucky in the fact that I could pretty much guarantee clients a hundred pound plus of catfish any day. How did, so that's fun because um, I, 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 I've had on David Sikorsky, who's run the Chesapeake Bay Association, and they talked about how like the blue cats have, have been in crazy. So like, um, like the, so the blue cat catfish issue that's happening right now. Blue cats were not in the river at the time. This was all channels. Did you, what was it like though, then versus now the catfishing, I guess, compare and contrast, like, has it gotten better, worse? Is there more of an infestation is the wrong word. It's too potent, but is there a difference? When I was fishing and I guided for probably three years as a catfish guide, uh, my average fish was 12 pounds. Wow. Channel cat. I did have a 29 pound, 12 ounce catfish at one time, which would have been the state record at the time. Wow. It lasted 
I think three months. Really? <laughs> when somebody <laughs> caught one just over 30 pounds, a woman. That's crazy. But that was a, a fantastic place to fish. The, the uh, discharge from the power plant, warm water discharge, as it came out into the river, the current would take it downstream and you'd fish in the mixing where the warm and the cold water was. When the tide was coming in, you'd fish the other direction, using nothing but cut herring or gizzard shad, hmm. and use a whole side. <laughs> I was out there one day catfishing with a couple of clients, and there was a guy out there that I'd seen many times out there in a uh, lap strake boat with a leaping striper on the side of it. <laughs> and he came up to my boat one day and I said, you know, hello, what can I do for you? He says, really, I ought to hit you. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm sitting out here catching catfish all day long a pound, a pound and a half, maybe two pounds. And I sit there and watch you catching them 12, 14, 15 pounds all the time. I said, and let me tell you, you're fishing shrimp or chicken livers or night crawlers. He says, how did you know? I said, the size of the fish. Mm. If you want to catch big catfish, you've got to use big baits. I'm using the whole side of a gizzard shad or a herring on a five aught hook on a bottom rig. And that's what produces them. Are, are there still a healthy population of channel catfish? Because at least on social media, I see a lot of blue catfish now, but I, I've actually never heard people talk about the channel catfish population. There's still a population of channel catfish in the river as is there a population of flathead catfish. In really? The yes. I didn't However, know that. Huh. it's nowhere near what it used to be. Yeah. The blue cats are edging them out. That's interesting. I, uh, the most interesting analogy I heard from it is like feral pigs, the blue cats, where it's just like they breed so bad, like rapidly. Exactly. And they expand everywhere. Exactly. My partner and I were fishing in uh, one of the lower creeks below Mattawoman. Last year or year before, I've forgotten which, when we actually looked down and saw the whole bottom of the creek moving. Wow. Uh, it was That's as awesome. big as this whole shop was solid blue cats. That's insane. All of them wow. ranging from probably a pound and a half up to three, four pounds. Can you tell a difference in how the river has changed over the years? Since Absolutely. The, what, what are you seeing? When I started fishing the river, there was no grass. We started fishing and learned to fish structure fishing. Mm. We were fishing drop-offs and points and rocks and any kind of hard surface or, or bottom contours. Uh, as soon as the grass came, it completely changed the complexion of the river. In a lot of cases, it got a whole lot better. In a lot of other cases, it got a whole lot worse. What do you mean? Well, it, our, our standard structure spots got grassed in. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And the fish are no longer there. Yeah. They were spawning areas that the fish can't spawn because the grass is too thick. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, that's that's the things that get worse. The better things is places where you had uh, an, an awful lot of small or medium-sized fish. Uh, because there was no grass, it didn't attract any bait. So the fish weren't there. No reason for them to come in. It, you know, some things got better, some things got worse. Well, how's the water quality been? Like, it, how has the water quality been over the years? Has the water quality it improved? It has not changed that much. Uh, you hear a lot of touting that it's gotten better yeah. because of the sewerage facilities. It's 
If you go into Oxland Cove in the back of the city, um, you still see an acre of trash floating on the surface where people are just throwing it in the water. Mm -hmm. And it's the things that you see are just absolutely shocking. Yeah, it's it's crazy, though, to think that we have such a beautiful fishery next to one of the absolute meccas of the world, because like you usually don't compare and contrast like wildlife and nature with basically downtown D.C. and dead bodies and things like that. Right. But they somehow actually work here because um, I remember some of the best days I've ever had was fishing in D.C., especially in the winter times, Blue Plains, places like that. And the fact that it's producing now is absolutely insane when there's probably more pressure on the water because of COVID and, and it brings people outside. Right. You, you speak of dead bodies. A, a good friend of oh, mine gosh. was a gentleman named Fletcher. I'm sure you've heard of Fletcher's Boathouse. Mm -hmm. He was a volunteer with the DC Fire and Rescue. And he was the one who went down into the 90 foot hole off Three Sisters Islands to recover the bodies of people who had uh, fallen in at Chain Bridge. Wow. And drowned and ended up on the bottom in that hole. Incidentally, one of my best catfish holes. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of the bodies, but... No, it's just chumming we, the water. That's because of the <laughs> drop-off. That's I crazy. I caught many a fish out there. How, <laughs> then how, did, how did the... Um, at, with that evolution, how did the tournament bass scene really evolve with you in particular with the foundation of New Horizon and, and how that went through? And then with your journalism, like how did these two things kind of come together? <laughs> Actually, I joined a, in, in conjunction with my guiding, I had an awful lot of people begin to ask me to take them fishing for bass. And that's when I got into bass fishing. And I joined a bass club, Northern Virginia Bass Masters. And after about three months, I decided I have really made a mistake here because of Number one, everybody in the club was rich except me. Uh, the competition was so fierce that one of my partners, who happened at the time to be the office manager for the White House, I was paired for a tournament. And on the way down to fish the tournament, we stopped at a tackle shop in Richmond and he bought every single bumblebee spinnerbait they had in stock. Wow, that is throwback. Wow. Close mm. to $300 worth back in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him, I said, do you need all those spinnerbaits? He says, no, but nobody else is going to fish them <laughs> either. It's like some things never change. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, that's one thing. Secondly, the dues for the club were $35 a month. Wow. And the club rented a cabin at Lake Gaston that members were free to use anytime. Uh, all of them had boats. All of them... <laughs> I'm second in command of the CIA. We had a dentist, a... Uh, insurance agent that had been around for 25 years, two contractors, one restaurant owner. I mean, these people were totally out of my league. And uh, as a result, my nephew and I quit the club immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but all of a sudden, I keep getting people asking, uh, why is there no club in Herndon? Well, one of them was so insistent that I said, well, hell, let's start one. So I held a meeting at the local Methodist church, and we had like 25 people show up. Wow. To form a club. And what was Herndon like? So I can't, I can't fathom. Like when I grew up in Vienna, I was blessed because we had one of the only parcels that had like an acre and a half of land. 
Um, I can't imagine though, and that was like in the early 2000s. What was Herndon like? Was it as big as it is now, with all the buildings and everything, or was it? No, <laughs> really? it expanded like everything else. Yeah. When I moved to Herndon in '64, the population was 4,000. Oh my gosh, that's. Uh, the town had a police chief. That's it, just a police chief, no officers. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> it was just a wonderful place to live. Uh, but over time, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And of course, the people who were born and raised in Herndon were pretty much a clique. And if you were a newcomer, you weren't in the clique. You were an outsider and you stayed an outsider. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't change. Uh, it took quite a while before the, the subdivision uh, got populated and that population changed the whole complexion of the town. And I feel like this is going to be a theme of the show because like my, my dad is a, a DC native. Actually, he was born in DC. His dad was, he was, he was really involved on in the white house, things like that. And back then I know it, it really was, it was like this DC mindset and it was a click of the people that worked for DC. And it's almost like as the government grew, this area just sucked in more people and it started to like, it started to like radiate out. And it's, I think it's going to be interesting because we'll, we'll get there eventually in our story guys about, the areas I grew up in, they just got, it's insane. Like how much this area blew up and it pushed out the outdoorsmen. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll get there in, in time, but yeah, that's just fascinating to me. But, um, to get us back on track, uh, you, you had 25 people show up to the club that you just founded. And then is this the club that originated what we have today? No, <laughs> this was lots of luck. Bass masters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was strictly a bass club. Uh, we had a number of military people uh, that assumed roles of leadership and did a good job with the club. And it was it was a going club, federation associated with BASS. And we had a good time with it. Um, toward the 80s, one of the individuals in the club was a teacher at uh, Herndon High School. And he and I were talking one day and decided that, you know, we really ought to be doing something to help the youth learn to fish. So we set up the kids fishing derbies that was with lots of luck bass masters once a year. And it was a spur of the moment thing. We, we really didn't have any planning into it. We just did it. And we did that until we founded the new club. Well, I left lots of luck Bassmasters because the ideals and mission that I had in mind for the club was totally changed by the ballot box. Uh, the new officers came in. The first thing they did was my vision of a club was you need to have, and my experience with the original club, you need to have a club that's affordable for new people coming in. Mm -hmm. And you don't want people that have been around like we are now forever and have the money to spend. You're looking for younger people people who have families and can't afford $100,000 bass boats and so forth. Yeah. So my vision was we hold fun tournaments, not heavy on competition, but more on social and educating and helping your partner learn more about fishing. To that end, we also need to eliminate cheating from any competition. The way to do that is eliminate the money. So instead of $100 tournament fees, let's do $10 entry fee, $10 per tournament. 
And, of course, we have to have operating money for the club, so let's keep our annual dues at a reasonable rate. We set it at $35. At the time, we were mailing out our newsletters, so we had a lot of money for postage, that sort of thing. And then we only returned half of the money as payback. And then we set aside 30% for donation to charity, giving back to the community. And that's a fishing charity of some kind. Well, that went by the board because the first thing the new officers did was jack the tournament fees from $10 to $100. And instead of sharing expenses between the non-boater and the boater, it was if the boater's boat had 50 horsepower or more as a motor, the non-boater had to pay him $75 in order to ride. If the motor was 50 horsepower or less, then it was a $50 fee. Well, this right off the bat puts everybody out if if a, a non-boater wants to learn to fish he comes in it's going to cost him 150 dollars and with that kind of money nobody's going to help anybody else so i decided that's it the final straw was we fished a tournament on the chickahominy river And I was flipping cypress trees on the lower end of the river. Uh, The water was two feet deep around the trees. And I'm just flipping. Well, you don't sit there and flip one tree all day. There's a whole grove, and you move from tree to tree to tree. I would start the outboard, put it in gear, idling from one tree to the next. And someone reported me because I did not have my life jacket on when I was idling from one tree to the next in two feet of water. The uh, member who reported me is one that I brought into the club, taught him how to fish, (laughs) and was finished right behind me in second place in that particular tournament. And I said, that's it. This isn't fun anymore. So I quit. I decided I'm not going to fish club tournaments. I can find plenty of people to fish with. So I'll just fish for fun. Well, I had a good friend over a five or six year period uh, kept begging me to join Red-Eyed Bassmasters in Vienna. Been around a long time and he assured me that everything was different there. Well, I joined it for a year and it wasn't any different. And I... (laughs) We fished a tournament out of Hopewell on the James River. And I had uh, a gentleman named Lou Sullivan who taught Roland Martin how to fish. Wow. Back when Roland lived in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, he was in the boat that day along with a Fairfax County police officer. And we ran down the James to a tidal creek I knew and fished marsh grass banks. And all three of us had limits. We had decent day, but it was average for that body of water. We came back for weigh-in and uh, I was getting the boat ready to come back up the road and they had set up the weigh station and one of the members came up and said, Charlie, you better get your fish up there. Uh, I'm sorry. First, he asked how you did. And I said, oh, we all got limits. He says, oh, he, well, you better get your fish up there because uh, they're getting ready to shut down the 
the way station. I said, uh, I'm, I'm probably not even going to weigh in. I'm just going to keep. He says, oh, yeah, sure. You got a limit. Uh-huh. I know. <laughs> well, I said, okay, let's see. And I got my fish out, got Moe's fish out, got Lou's fish out, took them up to the scales, and we finished one, two, three. <laughs> Fourth place was two fish. Wow. There were like 12 or 15 people fished. That's and insane. Did, you know, this kind of attitude, I don't need. And quit that club. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the same guy that begged me to join Red Eye came to me probably six months later, along with three others and asked me to help them set up a club, a new club. I said, well, I'll be happy to help you, but I'm not going to be a part of it. I want nothing to do with club fishing anymore. It's, it's just ridiculous. So we took about eight months going over every little detail, how we could set up the ideal club. And by the time we got through, we had worked out a board of directors running the club hmm. and the officers handling the day-to-day -day operations. But nothing happened without the approval of the board of directors. And the board of directors would consist of four founders. That's it. Um, a number of things. Number one, we would never associate with any tournament organization. No BASS, nothing. The competition would not be there. A $10 entry fee per tournament. Membership open to men, women, and youth. Mm. No other club allowed women or youth. It would be open to fly fishing as well as spinning and casting. Nobody allows fly fishing. This is a fun club. We would have draw team to, or uh, draw tournaments, but ordinarily you select your own partner. We actually ask people to vary the partners, fish with a different partner every tournament, because you can always learn something from somebody else. Team tournaments, we handle those a little different than most clubs. Each person could catch up to five fish, but you got credit for your partner's fish. Mm. So if you got a limit and your partner had one fish, you could continue fishing and cull up maybe a pound at a time with the fish, or you can help your partner catch a limit and you get credit for his five fish instead of just an additional cull fee. So it's kind of like the, the U.S. Open that happens at Lake Powell. It's kind of that kind of flavor. That's interesting. I like that. Huh. Well, it forces you to help your partner who isn't as skilled as you are at fishing or lucky as the case may be. <laughs> We also decided to have single lure tournaments. That's cool. I like those, yeah. As, uh, as an outdoor writer at that time, I was able to talk to manufacturers and get them to provide their new baits. Uh, I can remember a couple of them right off the top of my head. One was a bait called a sponge lure. What? That sounds like, is it a sponge with treble hooks? Like what is- It what is was it? a worm. Really? Made out of a sponge-like material that was just like a stick when it was hard. But when you put it in water, it gets as limp as a noodle. I still have some of them. He donated enough for one pack of blue and one pack of red for every member and we'd pass out the worms 
and fish only that worm all day. Was it Jewel? Jewel? J W E L. Wasn't it a Jewel worm we got? Jewel? No, it was called Sponge Lure. Okay. All right, let me go. I gotta go. Got Sponge Lure. S P O N G E dash L U R. I don't believe it's made anymore, but Sponge Lure. Sponge Lure. Worm. I still have the pack with the their address on it. So that is. That's wild. Like, because, like, I was thinking, like, what are co- what were a couple of the hot baits at that time? Well, sponge lure is one of them, of course. Like, well, it really wasn't a hot lure. <laughs> it really? failed oh. immediately. Okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a great time with it. My partner and I each put on a red and a blue hmm. on different rods. And my partner was a 70 plus year old. Uh, colonel, retired colonel from the army. And at the end of the day, we each still had the original worm on. I wonder how much that value is right now. Like with something had, like that. that is so freaking cool. <laughs> we had 10 plus fish each. Did well in the tournament. But as the worm got messed up, from setting the hook and so forth, we just cut off a quarter inch <laughs> and, and it was an eight inch worm. <laughs> just cut it off. At the end, yeah, yeah. I'm fishing it like this on a jig head. You got a crappie jig. <laughs> <laughs> Work like a champ. <laughs> oh, that is so freaking cool. Uh, another one we had was, uh, oh, a double uh, buzz bait with a double hook. Two hooks on a buzz bait. It's wow. called a double trouble. <laughs> um, there was another one. It was a jerk bait. I can't remember what was different about it at the moment. But every time we did that, it worked. Now, at that time, nobody in the club fished a jig. Really? Really. Everybody hated a jig. So we had a single lure jig tournament. Was it you could fish any that? kind of jig you wanted, but it had to be a jig. What was the jig not a big Potomac River bait at that time, or was it just that club that just didn't like that the jig? club? That is weird. That club, the members of that club would not fish a jig, huh. and everybody just downplayed the jig. They think it's awful, it's hard to fish, you, you never know when you have a fish on it, and uh. You don't catch many fish on it. Strange, every single person that fished the tournament that day had a limit on a jig. That is like, it's so wild. You would think that all of a sudden everybody would be fishing jigs. They still didn't fish jigs. People, Crazy. yeah, people are people. They're so, yeah. when some people are set in their ways, you, you you can't change it at all. Exactly. And but you you really it feels like you pioneered the idea of this single lure tournament. I know like some manufacturers now will have like frog only tournaments now. That's right. really popular. Yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, you literally you pioneered that mindset, which is it's unbelievable because it's it's such a oh yeah that makes sense kind of thing. Once again, it was introducing people to fishing different lures. Mm-hmm lures that they normally would not fish and yet every lure catches fish if you put it in front of a fish it it does it really does i mean i think i think jared's not here right now but his saying is like you know lures catch fishermen not fish like the colors everything else like that absolutely how many times have you heard of a kid catching a fish on a zebco rod with a hot dog too many times for how much i spend on tackle or a little (laughs) piece of red ribbon (laughs) Fish will eat what's in front, and the the, the, uh, the proof is in the pudding from biologists. When they open the bellies of fish, they find wood, they find glass, they mm-hmm. find everything in their bellies. No, like so. they're not as smart as we. Uh, what well, his friend was telling me about how he was took him fishing and only used pulled hooks with no bait. What's that? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> right. Are, uh, is the shad run big on the Potomac River? Are the shad runs a big thing on the Potomac River? Yes, fantastic. 
due totally to John Odenkirk. He's my cousin. Hmm? He's my cousin. Is that right? Wonderful. He, he is the greatest guy in the world. Um, no, you're yeah. fine. You're fine. That's the point of this stuff. <laughs> at, at Fletcher's Boathouse, yeah. the shad run is outstanding due to the stocking and and the uh, uh, information and, and expertise put into the program mm -hmm. by John Odenkirk. No, huge shout out to John again. Like, thank you so much. I mean, he's a he's a regular on this show, and, and the work that he's put in has been, especially with the snakehead issue. But he's been instrumental for helping Absolutely. these populations. Absolutely. Now, what Moose was talking about when I was guiding, I used to run herring and shad trips. Really, really. How is that like falling out of favor? I don't hear a lot about people shad fishing, or maybe I'm just not connected to that, but it's not as glamorous as I feel like it used to be. Well, I started it not so much fishing for shad. I went up to Fletcher's to catch herring as bait for catfish when I was catfish guy, hmm. because at the time the shad weren't there. Hmm. But I used a, just a, a standard crappy rig, the double crappy rig with the little gold yeah. hooks, put a one ounce sinker on the bottom of it and tossed it out into the middle of the channel where it's 50 feet deep and just let it sink. The schools of herring would come up the river and it, as long as the sun was out, a school of herring came up. If you cast in the middle of them, you've got two fish on. Now, were you fishing that on the bottom or trolling or how? No, how I actually tied the boat to a tree limb on the Virginia shore <laughs> okay. next to the bank <laughs> and cast straight out to the drop off and let it fall. And it's falling through the middle of the school of herring. And one of them will jump out and grab one of those gold hooks. And the, the, of course, the gold hook is just fluttering in the, yeah. the uh, just the flash of it all. It yeah, gets them. And people always ask me, why are they hitting a gold hook with no bait on it? I said, well, let's face it, they're in the process of spawning. Now, if you come home from work, <laughs> you come in the front door, and there's a nice big cardboard box blocking your uh, entrance into your bedroom and you hear your wife saying, honey, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> you're you're going to get that box out of the way. <laughs> well, fish don't have hands. <laughs> so they try to get it out of the way with their mouth. And if you leave that fish fighting in the water, instead of landing him immediately, the second hook will attract the second fish. So you'll end up catching two at a time. Mm. And I did a, uh, <laughs> a TV show, um, Celebrity Outdoors, on one of the, I think the country music channel with a country music singer named Sylvia and took her up there. She had never caught a fish before, and she almost cried when we said it's time to leave. Really? She was having so much fun catching herring, mm. pound herring. Well, and that's funny. Is like I've heard them called like like Jersey tarpon or things like that. They actually pull pretty hard. Oh, too. absolutely. And it, well, we were only using ultralight yeah. here with four pound line, so. You get two one-pound fish on four-pound line, you're doing well. That, that, gosh, we got Jenny. We gotta do more about that because, like, that is an old-school thing about fishing the herring runs and stuff. But that used to be a lot of fun in these areas to do. And this time of year, really? Yeah, that they say there's like a certain time of year that they would just take nets out there. Herring. Yeah. Dog. Yeah. yeah. That's when they would catch all their fish for the year. And I'm, back in the old days. I'm making a note oh, of that. Yeah, that right. that'd, that'd be fun. I that on a tour when it was my seventh grade. <laughs> 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 <
Yeah, yeah that's something. Yeah, yeah George just, Washington was big in in Shad. Yeah, there's a plaque out there. Rumor, rumor has it that that Shad is what got them through at Valley Forge. Honestly, I think it was the Delaware River, but it was the Shad Run that helped them survive yes, Valley, Valley Forge. Dead, big Shad Run on the Delaware. Yeah. Uh, the, the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg is dynamite in the spring for the Shad Run. Really? Yeah, you know, you've got fly fishermen and waders out in the river just below the Route 1 bridge. You just catch Shad the entire run, both Hickory and American. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. That is so cool. Jenny, are you bugging out? I was going to. Do you think she'll be still here by 4? Probably. Okay. To the club. I know we kind of like deviated there a little bit, but so this was the, we're up to the time where New Horizon is now is now not just just a concept in your head it's it's becoming a reality here now i want to kind of like pair that up and we're going to get back to to the club life your writing career because that is so unique how you went from you know fishing saltwater to a catfish guy to basically creating all these clubs how did in your story how did writing these reports how did that get involved well when i started guiding uh for bass uh, I had one particular individual ask me to take him smallmouth fishing on the upper Potomac. And I had a John boat, so I took him up there, smallmouth fishing. And in the process, people saw me, and one of them being Charlie Taylor of the Washington Redskins. Really? Really. And he spread my name around a little bit as someone who could put me put him on fish on the upper Potomac. And I I started getting gigs <laughs> fishing for smallmouth. And that made me go out and buy a bigger boat and a bigger trolling motor <laughs> and so forth. Mm. And I uh I fished up there. Well, I had one particular individual call me and ask me. If I would take him out, and I said, sure, why not? And he said, well, I'm 92 years old. I said, why would that make a difference? Really? Can you get in a boat? <laughs> he says, with help. I said, no problem. Can you sit in a boat and fish? He said, yes. I said, do you understand that we're an hour from the closest hospital? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, if those conditions are to your liking, no problem. We can go fishing. Well, I later found out that he was the father of one of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Really? <laughs> really. Wow. He was also the president of the Outdoor Writers Association of America. That is so fascinating, just the right place at the right time, honestly. Everything exactly. led up to that, well, to be able to have those connections. This this is really a beautiful story, though. I took him out and took him to one of my best spots. And he pulled out a fly rod. And I looked at that fly rod. It was split bamboo. The guides were taped on with electrical tape. <laughs> wow. I mean, this fly rod looked like it had been used well and hard and beat up something off. But he threaded the fly line and made a cast, and I knew I was in the presence of an expert. Bamboo, too. That is that is classical old school fly rod stuff there. And wow. the, the uh, rod tube was leather. Wow. His tackle bag was leather. <laughs> <laughs> he made... Probably five or six casts, caught fish on half of them. And within 20 minutes or so, he had a three and a half pound largemouth in the boat. Wow. He said, Charlie, are there any largemouth in this river? I said, yes, there are. He said, do you think we could catch one? I said, sure. So we were above White's Ferry. Okay. We're drifting down the river. Go beyond White's Ferry, and just below, there's a division in the river. And right at the mouth of it, there's a big bunch of pads, lily pads. I said, we normally can get a four, maybe a five out of these pads. On about his fifth cast, 
he had a four and a half pound large metal. Yeah. And he fought that just beautifully. He said, Charlie, first of all, I want to thank you for the day. And along the shore, as you go from where we were at Dickerson Power Plant, all the way back down drifting, there's nothing but farms on the Virginia shore and the Black Angus cattle in there. He said, those uh, full-bodied black deer over there. <laughs> and he started giving me a hard time the whole time because the wind started blowing and I was having difficulty controlling the boat, high sides and so forth. But he, he rode me bad about not being able to drive. He'd have to get a better chauffeur. <laughs> he was uh, just a fun, delightful guy to be with. At the end of the trip, he he wanted to leave then. And I said, well, you know, we haven't been out but a couple of hours. He said, Charlie, I love to get out. He says, but I can't stay out long. I said, that's perfectly fine. No problem. And I mm -hmm. took him back. He said, have you ever thought about being a writer? I said, no. He said, your storytelling deserves other people to hear it. And did you have any, like, was this literally the first time you thought about writing or did you ever like dabble in it before this moment in your life? Did you write at all? No. Okay. No. He told me, he said, uh, I, I said, I, I can't write anything. I don't know how to write. He said, Charlie, it's so easy. Do you have a typewriter? I said, yes. He said, do you type? I said, yes. He said, if you make like that typewriter is a person and tell them the story just as if you told it to me on the back of the boat, you're writing. That's all you need to do. And that's when I started. If I, I told the story to the typewriter. There is no way I could do that without spell check. My God, I would be screwed. <laughs> well, it. Oh, man. What, the, the difficult parts of it were keeping it within a reasonable length because oh. I had a, uh, a mandate from the newspaper that it could only be 200 words. 200 words? No, that isn't right. It's like no. two to four hundred, two to five hundred. I had a specific length. Mm. <laughs> the column could be a okay. specific length, and I had to keep it within that. And uh, he wrote the first column, introducing me as the new outdoor writer, and that I would be covering this, 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 and this in weekly installments every week. So look for his column here. And took that to the local newspaper, and the sports editor said, I'd love to have it. And he published it every week. He did a great job. And it, it just expanded from there because people, readers, called in and said, we enjoy the fishing column, but is it possible to get a fishing report? Mm. So that's when I started making up the fishing report and do a column and the fishing report. And then it got to the point where they didn't have enough space as I expanded the fishing report from Northern Virginia to the entire state of Virginia and then added the Chesapeake Bay and then Maryland. <laughs> that's crazy. What, what, what was the timeline on this? What, what, when was like the heyday you think of like, you went from like just the column to like, basically the whole dmv area like was that like a one year like year one you just did the, the column and then year two you expanded it basically no it was about two years i oh, did two. the column only okay uh and then the uh the fishing report went on until i think 2020 was 2020 yeah was when i uh quit doing the fishing well the the uh, the owner of the newspaper decided that people in Northern Virginia did not fish or hunt. Therefore, he put 
the damper on all fishing and hunting columns in favor of horse columns. How much has the culture changed? How much has the culture changed in this area fr from, I guess, from then till now? Because we talked about this a little bit, guys, before we started recording, where I grew up in Vienna and then I moved to Western Loudoun. I actually grew up on the shores of Sleaters Lake in Percival. And I remember when there was no houses around Sleaters and we would go swim there in the summertime when I was in high school. We took a little aluminum boat out there. And now it's houses. Everywhere you can see is houses. And I used to hunt around my house. And now that's a vineyard. And it's insane that so many people that are here now, they didn't even grow up in Northern Virginia. It, it, it's their, their, their transplants. And that's because of the government growing so much and it being the big basket. Are, are you seeing that culture shift? Absolutely. Completely. Uh, what do they call them? Uppies? Uppies. <laughs> Upwardly mobile. <laughs> uh, people that are coming in are working for the defense contractors, the government. It's just expanded so rapidly. My father used to work for the Department of Agriculture back when I was born uh, in Washington, D.C. Wow. Georgetown University Hospital. Uh, we moved or we lived at the time over in Riverdale, Maryland. And uh, after the war, well, it wasn't even after the war, it was before the war, we moved to Alexandria. We lasted there less than a year and then moved to 1943, we moved to Jefferson Village in Falls Church, uh, right off Route 50. As a matter of fact, Route 50 was completed one month before we moved in, mm. in August of 1943. And at that time, the Thompson's Dairy Milkman used to drive in the regular lane and park his truck on the pavement in the right lane of Route 50 walk across the dividing strip up to our front door and put the milk, go back to his truck, move down to two or three houses and do the same thing. <laughs> I was oh, man. commenting to my friend who came out with me today that when I was growing up as, as late as 14 years of age, 15, 16, the closest swimming pool to us, public swimming pool, was in uh, Middleburg. And we used to drive from our house in Jefferson Village out Route 50 all the way to Middleburg. And there was one traffic light between Jefferson Village and the public pool in Middleburg. It was... 30 some miles. Wow. <laughs> no traffic, no nothing. And now to get to the river, it might take two hours and it's sitting in bumper to bumper <laughs> traffic just to get there. Right. It, yeah. It's just insane. And it's just, it shows you that it, I, I don't want to call it, maybe it's not ignorance is the right word, where you have people that didn't grow up with the outdoor lifestyle and then just assuming because their bubble of people don't like fishing or hunting or they don't know people right therefore nobody in the world likes to do it and that's just such a shame i mean it, it really is you you were mentioning the subdivision when i moved to herndon sterling park did not exist really building it that's nuts gulf reston mm -hmm. was just beginning to think about building reston and reston now has over a hundred thousand people yeah. And Sterling easily. Park is in the 30,000 range. And Ashburn is now over 80,000 people. Ashburn is insane. Just there's there's not even like it's not even nice to look at the buildings. They're carbon copies built on each other. And it's just there's yep. too many houses and not enough outdoor stuff. And, and, and you know, it's so weird because like, I mean, I grew up listening, like reading your report, especially on like the Upper Potomac and like the Dickerson power plant when it was running. And that whole area, and then again, like the whole White's Ferry thing, I remember taking our boat and we'd use the ferry to get to the Maryland side to launch and to fish that area. 
And I mean, that's crazy because that, that's not even available anymore. Um, that I mean, right. that, that's crazy. Like how much things have changed in such a short period of time. I mean, absolutely crazy. Like, so how did you, and, and I think we talked about this before we started guys and we'll mention it now. Like when you did your fishing report, it was very unique. And the one thing you mentioned was how you got your information from the local individuals. How did that start where it was like, this is how I'm going to do it. And then how did you get people to, to want to join you? Well, I used to uh, read the fishing reports put out by a gentleman whose name escapes me at the moment in the Washington Post and the uh, uh, <laughs> the Evening Star <laughs> newspapers. And I would read their reports and compare it to my experience on the same bodies of water for that period of time and say, where in the hell is he getting his information? This is absolute ridiculous. So I determined that when I did the report and I started out in Northern Virginia only on those bodies of water that I was fishing. So the report was from me. Well, as I went around to the various bodies of water, I made friends, talked to different anglers. I was looking for those anglers who would fish that body of water two to three times a week mm -hmm. and would give me information on exactly what they did. And I was interested in those anglers because those are the guys who are out there all the time, and they really don't care whether there's anybody else coming in to fish or not. In fact, they would prefer it <laughs> if you didn't come down there, mm -hmm. leaving the water and the fish to them. Where I noticed that in these fishing reports from other publications, I find lures that they tout are lures that somebody in has got a stockpiled in yeah. their tackle shop that they couldn't sell. Yeah. And you never heard a bad report from a guide. The fishing is always great. Well, the fishing is not always great. <laughs> the fishing varies. It's up and down. So my intention was to find people who fish two to three times a week and would tell me the honest truth one way or another. And many, many times I've published, don't bother this body of water until next week. That's so important because we talk about that now on the show a lot where because the importance of sponsorship dollars, sometimes it feels like the trust and the authentic your authenticity of you as a person gets lost because yeah. you need the money and you'll have some anglers like just decked out with a company, whether it's Berkeley or Rapala, and they'll tell you like, well, this bait's the only one that will catch fish. And then you start to realize like, well, is that actually the case? Or it's because they're paying you to say that. And, and that, and that's hard because you need to have a good relationship with the people in the community to be able to get their support for it to grow. Exactly. I uh, have never been sponsored. I'll take that back. <laughs> I had a boat and motor sponsors. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never been paid. I have been given discounts. Uh, not for promoting their product, but because I've already used it and I'm in 100% favor of their product. Uh, I remember I used to start, I started out another story. I'm sorry. if I Go for it. No, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I used to do a column every spring uh, on just before the fishing season started. I would go to Ed's Bait and Tackle in Fairfax, which was the oldest business in Fairfax at the time. <sighs> And my premise for the article was, I have a list of items that are very infrequently found anywhere. And I would like to know if you have them. So I go into Ed's and I'm looking for 
a dip net with a 12 foot handle. I'm looking for a size uh, 16 aught shark hook with chain. <laughs> I'm looking for a size 26 fly hook. I'm looking for a Shorty Evans trolling motor prop. Mm. Things that nobody carries. Mm -hmm. Ed's bait always had them. <laughs> but it was weird. <laughs> one time I went in there. Oh, another one was always had was a, a three pound snag hook. Oh, wow. For snagging bodies. They had them for rescue. So can I say like that? Is that a big market back then for like those type of hooks? Yeah, they carried them just for the rescue people, <sighs> for the Upper Potomac and the Lower. Oh Potomac. man, that's crazy! But I, the uh, the gentleman in Ed's bait one time told me he said, "Charlie, I, I can't give you the twelve foot handle dip net because I'm not going to cut two feet off it." <laughs> he had fourteen foot handles. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just fabulous. Anyway, uh, every year that went on, that was that was great. I was in there one day, and he had a new reel sitting up, and he had to show it to me. It was a Shimano 100EX. Mm. It was the first one of the Shimano reels. Um, and I'm looking at it, and it Beautiful, you know, it's smooth. He says, isn't that wonderful? I said, yeah. I said, however, I can't use a bait casting reel. And he said, why not? And I relayed to him my experience with a bait casting reel. You know, cast, cut the line off, re-spool. Cast, cut the line off, re-spool. He said, Charlie, if you buy this reel, and use it exactly the way I tell you. He said, you use it for three months. If you are absolutely delighted with it, you bring it back and I'll give you every penny you paid for it back. Wow. I said, hell, I can't lose. So I paid him a hundred dollars. Wow. This is maybe the late seventies, perhaps early eighties when a hundred dollars was a lot of money. Um, I use that reel and no problem at all. Really? Learning to cast a bait caster, that particular reel. Well, because of that and teaching my clients to use a bait caster, there's no way you could do that with a, a Garcia reel at the time, which was the number one reel. But the cast controls and so forth on the, the uh, Shimano were such that it made it easy to do the way he taught me to use it. So I taught my clients. And within an hour, I could teach a client to cast well enough to catch fish that day. I amassed, a, a, I think I had 15 of them at one time. But I was at the uh, classic outdoor show in Richmond. I believe it was 1988. Uh, and I talked to Gary Shimano, who was the head of Shimano American, and asked him for a discount, a guide's discount, on these reels because they were so expensive. Mm -hmm. And every one of my clients used my equipment. Uh, other guides told me, don't do that. Let them use their own. They'll break yours. Well, I wanted people to catch fish. Mm -hmm. So they use my equipment. And I told him, I said, I probably sell 100 to 150 of your reels every year just from teaching them to cast with your, your reels. He said, Charlie, we don't give discounts to anybody because we don't need you. Really? I said, you know, the people at ABU Garcia right across the hall have offered me 12 combos a year 
if I'll allow my clients to use them. He says, well, you better go over there and take them up on it because you ain't getting anything from us. Is there? A- and I said, there will never be a time I will ever put a finger on a Shimano piece of equipment again. And I sold every one of those reels, <laughs> rods, and went with ABU Garcia and stayed with them until Luz came out with much better equipment, and I use nothing but Luz now. How has the culture in the business side of the industry changed? And that's a great, you know, I guess segue into that where going from then to now do you see like there's a disconnect from the business side of things and are things run now like shimano was back then or are things run more like arbo garcia is run it's 50 50 there are certain companies that will give you a discount if you are providing a service for them and that's the big thing Mm -hmm. you have to be promoting their product um People raise heck about Roland Martin because <laughs> he'll tout five different products before he says hello. Yeah. But that's what he has to do to get those products. Um, I don't ask for discounts from companies that I don't use their products. If you have a product coming on the market, I'll be happy to test it. And I pay full price for testing it. Um, I can remember uh, needing a rain suit. So I called up Cabela's. And I said, I've heard such great things about the guide Mm -hmm. suits. And they were running $600 at the time. And I said, I think it's about time I try one. He says, what size are you? And I gave him my size and he sent it out to me. And I used it for, I guess, three months. And I called him back up and I said, I love it. It's time to pay for it. And I paid for it full price. No mm. problem. Loved it. Um, Doug Hannon came out with a reel. I've forgotten the name of it. But it had a ridged rim around the spool top Hmm. and it was built to eliminate loops in a spinning reel Hmm. and it did the job beautifully but i called the number that was provided in fishing tackle retailer (laughs) not in the world expecting doug hannon to answer but he did wow the fishing professor answered the phone himself. And I talked to him about the reel. He said, try to let me send you one. You're not going to believe it until you use it. So I gave him my address and he sent me one. I used it, called him back up and said, send me, I think it was six more in various sizes. And I paid full price for them because I love the reels. Now, by the same token, in Luz, uh, Luz sent me uh, a letter offering a discount. Wow. Because I sell so many of their products. But everybody that fishes with me uses my equipment. And I I don't promote anything I don't love. Mm. So, guys, what I'm thinking here is we're going to take a bathroom break. and then Um, I can tell you, uh, I've seen Charlie set a hook on a five-pound bass sound asleep. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I remember that story. All right, Charlie. Yeah, let's let's hear that one. I can also... I don't know it. (laughs) I don't know know what he's talking about. We're on the Chickahominy fishing Limit Creek. And you were sound asleep at the trolling boat. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to work for 7-Eleven. I retired from 7-Eleven <laughs> back in 70-whatever. Uh, and I used to work, 
maybe 16, 18, 20 hours a day. And fishing the Chickahominy, you're talking about a three hour drive down there. So I work, you know, my, my normal shift, 16 hours and then get in the truck and drive three hours to the Chickahominy and no sleep. We're down on a little place called Limit Creek. That's not the official name. That's your name. That's my name. <laughs> it has no name on the map. It's sand and a little water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I am quite frequently accused of fishing damp sand. <laughs> Not a deep water fisherman. <laughs> but I'm on the trolling motor, just drifting back this creek, following the creek channel. And I went to sleep standing up. <laughs> Uh, all I'm doing is, this is the greatest fishing method in the world, because you have a... Sleep trolling? A marsh. <laughs> What's that? Sleep trolling? No. no. <laughs> you have a marsh grass bank. Yeah. And the, the little indentation in the grass. You drop a plastic worm in there, let it fall to the bottom, and then you pull it off a drop. And the drop is only one foot. And you watch your line. And the line starts moving. And you pick the fish up and drop him in the boat. And that's all he's <laughs> doing. <laughs> well, that particular creek, here again, you, you think I'm crazy. But if you can smell the paper factory from Hopewell, while you're fishing this creek, you're going to have a great day. Really? 25 fish over two pounds average. Hmm. If you can't smell the paper factory, get out. Really? That is so interesting. Yes. Well, that's because the wind is blowing a particular direction. So you need the wind to blow a certain direction to have this right. amazing days. Yes. That is crazy. But... <laughs> We're just drifting down on the trolling motor, and I went to sleep. <laughs> and the fish woke me up. <laughs> Didn't get my rod because I keep <laughs> like that. And it worked. <laughs> but you, you talk about a, a tournament of that kind, I had a better one on Lake Anna. The day before the tournament, my outboard caught fire. Evan Rude was having a problem with their outboards. So I couldn't get it fixed overnight. So the next morning we went out of the marina, High Point Marina, and I just dropped the trolling motor and went right straight across. And I'm fishing the riprap on the bridge, okay. 208 bridge, where the creek channel, the old river channel, comes up right up next to it and goes back out. And once again, <laughs> I'd been working and so forth. Had no sleep the night before, and the weather was just gorgeous. It was beautiful sunshine, nice gentle breeze. It was ideal for sleeping. And I'm sitting on the front of the boat. Fishing a jig. Fish, yep, fishing a jig. <laughs> Threw the jig out, walked it down the channel, and I went to sleep. <laughs> and the fish woke me up, and I put him in the boat and went back to doing the same thing. And the second one woke me up. And the third one woke me up. <laughs> and the fourth one woke me up. You have to sell a special, like, I don't know, Tempur-Pedic pillow to advertise this technique. The, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm the, sorry. You need to sell some specific uh, technique stuff, like a pillow or something for this, for the avid <laughs> angler. Oh, my goodness. We also won the tournament that day. It, it, really? You won the tournament? <laughs> 
Hey. Your sleeping technique. <laughs> I told you, luck has a lot to do with it. Uh, and skill. It takes a lot of skill to be in the right place. Now, you were talking about getting in this box? Yeah, let's get in that box. Okay. Remember I told you I keep a thing of notes when I'm watching your yes. podcast? Yes, I you remember. You had three guys on here, guides. And I was listening to all of them. They were all on smallmouth waters. And it occurred to me, the Upper Potomac, one of them mentioned gold baits. Yeah. Well, before I get into that, let's, let's do that. When I was guiding, I used basically two baits, just two. My clients used two baits. Mm -hmm. This is one of them in a smaller size. Mm -hmm. This is a Bagley Diving B1. Mm -hmm. This is the same bait, same color bait. This is a diving killer B2. Now, the diving killer B1 is only that long. Mm -hmm. And that was my chief bait. This color is a 6C9. It was a discontinued color back in 1970. But I found some of them in a hardware store, this color, and it caught fish so well, I went to Lee Sisson, who was the originator of this bait and worked for Bagley, and got him to make me baits that I wanted in this color. But I had to buy... 30 dozen of them. Dear the Lord. Wow. That's a thousand dollars worth. And I bought generally two times a year. So I've used about 60 dozen of them a year for the 17 years I was guiding. Mm. Uh, I sold them to my clients. I was paying $2.99 for them and selling them for $3.99. Oh, wow. But it is an absolute dynamite bait. Why do you think that color is so effective? It looks like a bluegill. The green back, the yellow belly with the orange. Mm. It's a bluegill. And the bass's number one food is bluegill. Now we get to the other one. You have to have plastic. And this is what I call the Charlie Worm. It is a five inch ring rascal hmm. in electric blue with a fire tail. And everybody says, why that color? Well, back in the day, you, you ask how the rivers changed. Back in the day, we had crabs at National Airport. Wow. In the middle of the summer. Right on through to the fall. What color is a crab? I think I have an idea. Blue and red. <laughs> I used to be able to throw this uh, anywhere and dead stick it and have fish take off with it. One of the beautiful stories, the Lady Bass Classic was held on the river three years in a row, and I was a press observer. And I had this young lady <laughs> that took me out, took me to the mouth of Dogue Creek, and she was fishing a buzz bait. Hmm. And after I netted five fish for her, all of them in the one pound range, 
all of a sudden, the catching just died. She wasn't catching anything. But she kept on throwing the buzz bait. Well, I was not allowed to give them any information, but I could fish. So I took my worm and tossed it out into an isolated little patch of milfoil. I thought you were going to say you threw it at her. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Do what? I thought you were going to toss it at her, just like no, a hard hint. No, no I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I, I cast it to a little isolated patch of milfoil. And all of a sudden, it started streaming out. So I tapped her on the shoulder and pointed to the line that was streaming. And I shook the fish off, came to the surface, shook the fish off. It was about a three-pound fish. Wow. So she throws that buzz bait again. And I cast this thing out to another isolated patch. And the line starts streaming out. So I get her name, and I forgot her name now, but I, I said, look, <laughs> there it goes again. She keeps throwing the buzz bait. I shook off five fish, every one of them over two pounds, mm. and she kept throwing the buzz bait. And finally, she got upset that she wasn't catching anything. Fired up the boat and off we went to the mouth of Broad of uh, Broad Creek. We get to the mouth of Broad Creek and she starts throwing that buzz bait again. Well, this is all isolated milfoil, and I'm thinking, why would you throw a buzz bait on isolated milfoil in four feet of water? So I pulled out a Johnson Silver minnow in gold, put a Charlie Worm trailer on it, threw it out and pulled it through the mill foil and the first cast had a four pounder. <laughs> wow. And I shook it off. No problem. My cast one more time came back out. This one was a two pounder and it wasn't going to shake off. It had it. It was not going to let go. And she sees both of these and keeps throwing the buzz bait. And I sat down. I said, that's it. <laughs> now, the press observers also had a $500 prize for the biggest fish caught. And we were allowed to bring in one fish. I took a jig and threw it on the other side of the river into the main channel. And within two minutes, I had a four pounder on the fish. <laughs> Somebody else had a bigger one, but you know. Is the crab population, does it fluctuate? Um, so like, what, was there a hey, was there a peak period where like that color always dominated or or does it still dominate? And would that be associated with the crabs just like there's just a lot of crabs in the river? It no longer dominates the way it used to, but neither do the crabs. In the mid 80s, the crab population in uh, peaked. Interesting. I the mid 80s is to 90. I wonder if that has to do with the stripers too, or, or what, or is there just more crab pots? And it stuff? could very well be stripers because uh, the I forgot the name of the outfit down in Reedville I know. that is fishing all of the Minheaden out of the the bay. That's a thing too that I got to figure out to get. There someone is on to talk no about. bait in the bay now. In the eighties, it was not at all unusual for a charter boat with six people on it to bring in 400 12 plus pound bluefish in a day. Why do you think there's such a depletion of Manhattan? Why do you think the bait in the Chesapeake is not what it used to be? Well, Have you ever been down there and seen these factory ships? No, not, not in a long time. If you go down to Reedville South, you will see a factory ship. This is a 300 plus ship, 300 foot plus ship, uh, with two associated uh, center console boats with nets on them. And what they're actually doing is one end of the purse seine, which is what it is, 
is tied to the stern of the ship. And these boats take the rest of that first scene out and make a big circle mm. around the whole school of Menhaden. Bring it back. And the factory ship has a vacuum in there that vacuums all of those fish into the hold of the ship. So, are and the schools of fish are found by helicopter. Mm. Are, are, are these United States businesses? Or are they foreign businesses doing this kind of stuff? The headquarters of the company is Dallas, Texas. Really? Really. Mm. They have seven factory ships based out of Reedville. Wow. Some of them are fishing the bay. The rest of them are fishing the coast, Atlantic coastline. That's that's crazy. I mean, it's the fact that we are in 2023 and we are still having these issues is, is insane to me. Yes, it is. That we can't balance it out. The, the biggest problem, though, is because they're taking all the Menhaden out of the bay, the stripers and the bluefish and the gray trout have nothing to eat. So they are eating what is available. Juvenile crabs, stone crabs, eels. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? Well, yeah, well, you're you're president for a day. What would you do? Get rid of the protein factory in Reedville. Okay. Let the Manhattan reproduce. It'll bring back Right now, you can't find a bluefish over two pounds in the bay. How do how do they let it get this bad? Where I, I'm hearing more and more people complain it, about it's about called this greed. Well, yeah, not only from the the standpoint of the the factory ship people, mm -hmm. but from the politicians. I, I just had an episode earlier today uh, with, with two nice guys, and we were talking about this with, with laws and everything because of live scope and forward-facing sonar and how crappie fishermen are able to be so much more efficient because of technology where you could see the fish and catch it, and politicians and government uh, actors are not willing to change maybe like some slot limits because it's easier to harvest them. And my analogy is like government, the problem is like they're so reactive versus proactive. It's like they have to wait for the bay to get terribly bad before they'll ever do anything about it, which is like, I, I don't know why you have to wait until everything's on fire before you try to fix something. Exactly. It makes no sense at all. Exactly. It makes no sense. I mean, <laughs> I've caught an awful lot of bluefish in the bay. I love to eat bluefish. Really? Absolutely. I feel like it's too oily, though, isn't it? Not if you do it right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> you catch the fish, you fillet it right then, put it in a plastic bag, and take it home with you. Then you put it in a bowl of salt water and soak it all day. That night, you change the salt water, put fresh salt water in and soak it again the next day, and you cook it that night. That salt water takes all of the oil out of it and firms up the meat. Mm. Then you fix a beer batter and chow down. <laughs> I'm going to have to steal that. That sounds actually really good. I never thought about doing that. Huh, that's really cool. I used to, when I worked for the Postal Service at Dulles Airmail Facility, every holiday we held a fish fry. And I'd provide the blue fish and we fry bluefish there and mm. coleslaw and watermelon and that's we just had awesome. a ball that's freaking awesome um charlie the one thing i wanted i wanted to talk about too is your your youth your youth work and the tournament that got me kind of into everything that you did at lake fairfax and literally i i, I need to know the back how did that start at lake fairfax how did that all get going uh like well the first tournaments that we did we're not at Lake Fairfax. Really? Really. The first one we did was at the Verizon building off oh, 625 mm -hmm. in Loudoun County. Because that was the only pond we could find around to had some fish in it. 
the next year we went to Snake Den Lake in Reston. But the Homeowners Association there were not happy about that. So the following year, we went to Lake Fairfax, and we've been there ever since. They are now a, an official sponsor. Really? Right, the Fairfax County Park Authority. Uh, Dan Grolke, who is the manager of the waterfront parks for Fairfax County Park Authority, is on our board now. That's awesome. So, how, how many years have you been there with Fairfax now? At Lake Fairfax? Yeah. 31 years. 31 years now? Yeah. It, why? I don't even know how to phrase this. There's not enough water available for kids to actually get out there and fish. Like, I know Franklin Park in Percival has a little pond now. Fairfax is one. It, what is with this idea that we're just going to build houses, but we're not going to build ball fields or ponds or, or things to get people hooked? It makes Is it because there's no money in it? Is that it? Uh, you can't say that. Because... There are an awful lot of small neighborhood ponds in Reston, mm. Lake Newport, Lake Ann, and so forth. Uh, when they built Ashburn, there's a lot of neighborhood ponds in Ashburn. And the Homeowners Association actually stocks the ponds. Really? Really. You need to get now, that is the not ponds. true in Reston. Okay. Uh, it used to be true. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say it's not true. I don't know that if it's it's still that way. They used to stock them definitely in Lake Ann. Yeah, I remember uh, that. And in South Lakes. Because at one point they wanted our club to go into South Lakes and take out some of the smaller fish. And we were not willing to put up with their rules and regulations. It's just so weird because, like, like you said, like the Ashburn ponds and stuff, and maybe it's just like it's word of mouth. But I have never heard of some of these ponds in Ashburn available, like to the public. That is, um, that's interesting. That's it, really interesting. They're not. Oh, okay. It's homeowners, or you know, homeowners only. Mm, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, because like, yeah, that that's something like I know Red Rocks, and I think that it's called Red Rocks in Leesburg. That apparently may or may have some access, but. I don't know. I was talking to Matt Sell of the Maryland DNR a couple months ago, and we talked about like it would be great if like for every three houses built, they had to donate some land for something. Right. Because it's just you should have more Lake Fairfaxes available to the public to where you can get people hooked on fishing. Well, there are a few others. There's Burke Lake. Burke Lake is going. Yeah. There's Cook Lake in Alexandria, which is also a publicly stocked trout lake. Hmm. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, there's royal lake in alexandria yeah i'm taking notes right now locust shade in prince william which well it it may not be any good for fishing by the time they get through with it and and lake lake manassas i guess is shut down right you can't get on lake can you get on lake manassas or is that lock and keyed what's that lake manassas Closed due it's closed. to the closed mind of the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, we were taking up a collection to have a hitman. I, it, that makes like that and Beaver Dam Reservoir in in Leesburg. I mean, that I think Beaver Dam just opened up to the public. It's, Beaver it's Dam's in Loudon. Yeah, because like that was closed for a couple of years because they right. set a, a dam work. But that and yeah, if Lake Manassas was open, that'd be amazing if we could get that open. I held the state record or the the lake record out there for a really? number of years for catfish. I remember I remember catfishing at Lake Brittle back in the day, like when that place was on fire. Yep. Because my aunt used to fish Lake Manassas until it shut down. Right. She started to fish Lake Brittle more. Yeah. The uh, the mayor almost had me arrested one day for uh, publishing a fishing report on Lake Manassas. Wait, what? Yeah. He said, how'd you get this information? I said, from a homeowner who lives there. Oh, my gosh. He says, well, if you do this again, our legal department will have you arrested. And the newspaper said, don't 
do it. <laughs> don't publish it. What do I don't even know how to work? Do homeowners have too much power when it comes to bodies of water? It's just so crazy that you it look, depends on the amount of money involved. Those are million dollar houses. Because I'm saying, like, 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 um, example is like, I think there's an issue on Lake Anna with these big wake boats yes. that create erosion issues. But then you can't get anyone to talk about it because it's like, well, guess whose money is paying for the community? It's the people that own those big wake boats. Well, they're going after the wrong people. The lake is owned by Virginia Power. Mm. And if you get a coalition together and go against Virginia Power, you're going to get something done. You're not going to get anything done going through politicians or through the Game Commission. It has no jurisdiction. Mm, interesting. Gaston, Roanoke Rapids, Bugs Island, and Lake Anna are all owned by Virginia Power. And they have sole determination for the first six feet of shoreline. Hmm. You can't put a shed or a boathouse on the shore of Lake Anna or any of the others. That's really neat. I didn't know that. Hmm. That's good information. Yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to get somebody on the show at some point because I want to talk about the erosion issue because I know like Deep Creek is also having they're doing studies about that as well about right just how the constant wave action i fished a kayak tournament last summer um actually on like anna it was like by noon i felt i didn't feel safe because of just how much boat traffic there was in that place the answer to that is to allow wake boats on salt water or any lake comprised of x width a mile mm -hmm whatever like bugs island for example so they're not allowed on bugs oh yes they oh are. they are okay okay gotcha 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 yeah so i don't know of any place they're not allowed do you think we'll ever see more lakes built no really too much money interesting too much money because I, I just think like it would you could make so much money because you could put houses next to it and jack up the value. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, not big lakes like Lake Frederick or Manassas size would be right. nice to see, because I know I had the the privilege of going down to the Richmond area and got to fish hunting run reservoir and places like that that are re relatively new. It, it just be like, I don't know, maybe it's just me being an outdoorsy guy, but it's just like, it would have been so nice to see something like that built in like northern Virginia. 20 to 30 years ago when you needed it. Right. But I, I don't know. Hunting Run is the latest that I know of. Yeah. But that was, yeah, it's such a great place. But I mean, thank you so much for coming on today, Charlie. And then I know we're almost like we're approaching like the two hour mark here. Is there anything that you want to cover or you want to, you want to plug to, uh, to all your fans watching right now? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Uh, for probably 27 years, there has been a show, a flea market, at the Dale City Fire Department in Dale City, Virginia. Uh, I believe it's three years ago, the gentleman who had ran it for 25 years uh, decided that he could no longer do so and ask us if we would take over the show. And our youth foundation decided to give it a go. Well, we did it for one year and then we couldn't because of COVID and we're back into it again. Um, we held it in 2022 and it is ready to go again the first Saturday in February at the Dale City Fire Department. We specialize in having vendors there who uh, have new and innovative baits, as well as guides, tackle shops. We have one gentleman who will be actually creating lures on site, doing crankbaits mm. and painting them, so forth. There's another one that will be making spinner baits on site. 
a number of guides, uh, plastics manufacturers, and uh, retailers. It's a good show. The biggest single thing for us, we don't make a whole lot of money on it. In fact, if it weren't for the generosity of certain people, we would lose money on it. But it's worth it to us because it's a place where we can renew friendships within the fishing community. People that we don't see all the time. Once a year, they come up to the show and we'll see somebody who's from southwestern Virginia that we seldom see. But it's, it's a great time. Entry fee, I believe, is $5. Uh, kids wow. are free. And hopefully, <clears throat> people get a lot out of it. We are always soliciting members for our club and volunteers for the Kids Derby. Uh, I didn't mention the Kids Derby, but... Well, we, we got another 20 hours, so if you want to plug it real quick, we got we plenty of time. What? We got plenty of time. Oh, okay. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> the Kids Derby <laughs> is, is basically a... Uh, <laughs> A derby for all kids ages 15 and under. Doesn't matter where they're from. If they show up and they're under 15, 15 or under, they're welcome at no charge. The club or the foundation is fully founded, uh, funded. <laughs> I can't talk. Fully funded by both the club members who donate 50% of all tournament fees toward continuing the operation of the Derby. Now, as I mentioned originally, our tournament fees included a 30% donation to charity. Uh, in the ensuing years, that has been changed to the Youth Foundation is the only charity. Mm. <laughs> and 50%, which amounts to in excess of $1,000 a year, which funds the uh, Youth Foundation. All of our, every kid who shows up gets a goodie bag filled with fishing tackle that they can use when they're not fishing our tournaments. And then is, does this have a website for? Yes. This? Guys, again, as always, link in the episode description to you know everything we talked about to, today. New Horizon, and then also the, the charity, and then uh, the flea market. All three will be linked in the episode description, so you can find that information if you want to either support it, you want to join the club, or you want to donate. Um, sorry to cut you off. Continue. We have a Kids Derby winner right here. Would you like to speak? Uh, yeah, get him in here. Would this show up? Huh? Would this show up? Oh, this will show up. Right. Yep, sit right there. We got another mic. Click right. that off right there. <laughs> yeah, that was me from a long time ago. All right, it's working. All right, I'm Ethan Liu, and I've been fishing Charlie's Derby since I was four years old. I just turned 18. So it's been a good 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, explain. Yeah, just go for it. I want to know what got you into fishing. Like, how this all started. I'm gonna clap real quick just so I can sync up the extra mic and post recording. There we okay. go. Perfect. Like, yeah. How, how did all this start? Well, I was young, so I remember too many of the details back then, but my mom and dad wanted me to go fishing, and they saw an ad for the derby, and they said, hey, we'll take them out. So when I was four years old, I enjoyed it a lot. I think I my first one when I was six, right? I won the derby for the first time when I was six. And then ever since then, both me and my brother have been either fishing the derby or volunteering there once we aged out. Awesome. Yeah. That's that's freaking awesome. Because again, like, like this is something like it got me hooked too when yeah. I fished the derby. And it's so crazy because like there's just not a lot of opportunities to get you hooked mm -hmm. on the sport. Like when you know my dad was younger and they would keep a shotgun in their in their car after school because <laughs> they would go like you know they'd go hunting. That doesn't exist anymore. And it yeah. and it doesn't mean like we can't get people hooked on it again. They just need the opportunity. Yeah. So what was the key for you to have so much success from the from the derby standpoint? Just to give people at home some tips. Well, definitely my mom and dad. They both are experienced anglers themselves, so they help too. 
But I remember there was this one gentleman, you know, the guy who had a buck hat, took pictures. Yeah, he was there. That's probably the time I caught my first Jim fish. Fagans. Yeah, Jim Fagans. Yeah. yeah. I think he passed away a little no, bit. No, oh, no. No, he lives in Fredericksburg. Oh, okay. Huge shout out. You're still alive. Good job, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he was there. Um, I know he was a club member and he helped me catch my first fish too by giving us a little bit of tips because my mom also grew up fishing this area too. Oh, cool. And it was the combination of both of those where we always had a good time when we went out, whether it was rain, rain or shine. Didn't really matter. So we went every single year except for the COVID year because they didn't have it. So like when I did the tournament, it was like every fish counts. Mm -hmm. You could measure them. Like, was that the same format when, yes, you, when yes. you did it? Yeah, same format. So when you did that, what was like the key fish that stood out to you in that tournament? Man. The key one that you remember to this day. I mean, there's the first blue guy I caught, which is beautiful. I still remember. I think it was a pumpkin seed. We right. had the really pretty colors on them. Yes. Then there was, I mean, really shifted over the years based on the fishing I like. So for example, COVID time. I got into bass fishing, cat fishing, carp fishing. Then in the springtime, I got into crappie fishing for the first time. So remember the derby before I aged out, I actually caught a couple of crappie there and helped me win one more time before I left is because the crappie, the length of the crappie counted as more than bluegill. So I actually ended up winning due to that. Gee, and, yeah, it's not about catching the biggest one. It's about, it's about the reps. Like you yeah. got to get as many as possible. That's the, like the secret sauce. <laughs> well, and species too. Cause like an eight inch crappie is going to yeah. weigh more than an eight inch bluegill. Oh yeah. So I remember I, I want mine because of the crappie. I know my brother won his year cause he just aged out recently. He'll be volunteering the summer with me, but he won his cause he caught, what was it? Three bass or four bass? That two year? bass. Oh, two. Yeah. Yeah. He caught two bass and they're both saw like two pound yeah. bass at the Derby. Hmm. One of them was three and yeah, the other one was a pound and a half. Yeah. And he won the derby because of those two. He got lunker also. What is the biggest lunker out of like all the years you've done the derby? Have you seen what's the biggest fish pulled out of that lake? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it has to be a catfish because somebody yeah. gets a decent catfish every year. Yeah. Every I derby. There was trout in there one time. Really? really? Yeah. There was a big trout caught one year. Oh, wow. Huh. What's the biggest bass you've seen pulled out of there? Well, it used to be uh, that. The Lake Fairfax was stocked in the winter with trout. Yeah. But if they don't get caught, they die because the water gets mm -hmm. too warm for them. Now, you, your ears perked up earlier when we were talking a little bit about trout and that yeah. one certain <laughs> lake. Like, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, so like I said, my fishing, as I get older, I like to grow my experience for it. Mm -hmm. So normally during the seasons, I tend to have a new interest, if you want to call it that. So I went from crappie to carp to catfish and this year specifically in the winter time i've been trying to catch trout so in previous years haven't had much luck for this year started talking to charlie getting some advice and we do fish cook lake and locust shade because locust spots around local spots around here and had pretty good luck with the trout there what's the key what are some what are some things that you learned from your experience this fall or in winter with trout fishing uh, talk to Charlie. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I said, in previous years, I haven't had much luck. I, like the first time after talking to Charlie, I caught my first limited trout. But in previous years combined, I maybe caught two trout total. That first day was four because it was urban fishing. So mm -hmm. limit was four. So what's your favorite place to fish right now? Like, it, Like if you wanted to go out between now and March, like where would you go? Oh man, that's a tough question. <laughs> I mean... Honestly, I'm indifferent to either because whether I go fish Cook Lake or Locache, it's still 40 minutes either north or south. So my house is pretty much in the middle. Both places have beautiful scenery. It's pretty clean, well-kept parks. So honestly, I'm indifferent to either. It's just mainly who stocks it more frequently. Now, do they have bluegill and bass in there as well? Or is it just pretty much trout that you're going for? Uh, they do have bluegill and bass, but I don't really target those right now as I'm focused for trout. Mm. But we were at Cook Lake one time and mom actually caught a catfish on power bait. Really? Which was shocking. Yeah, she thought she had the biggest trout because obviously we're competitive. <laughs> you know, like, nor like normal families are very competitive. So we were having a numbers game and a big fish game, Lunker. And man, she set the hook and that drag started pulling. And she, th she thought she had the biggest trout in the lake on. Ended up being a catfish <laughs> on power bait. Okay, give me the biggest trout you've ever caught in your life. 14 inch, about a pound and a half. Pound, yeah, pound and a half. It was a fat one. Dude, that's not, that's not bad at all. That's yeah. pretty nice. That was a, it was a good fish. Give me one goal for this year you have catch a brown trout Ooh, where can you do that around here that'd be fun those things get big well supposedly they still they still stock them in the lakes really but i haven't seen many people catch them i haven't caught any personally of course but supposedly they're there 
That would be fun. Yeah, I've always wanted to catch a big brown trout, or at least try to catch it on a jerk bear or something. Like actually, yeah. like bass type would be yeah. really cool. Ultralight seems like it'd be a pretty fun thing to do. That yeah, that would be a lot of fun. That would be that, and grow my Instagram account because that's always <laughs> that's always a fun thing to do. Well, yeah, plug it. Go for it. All right. Well, my account's anything that swims forty eight. I started over COVID, so that's when I started. My fishing really took off, and. Yeah, it's been it's been a journey ever since. You can see my phases from carp to catfish to crappie to now trout. So anything that swims, yes. All right. So yeah, send that to me so I can put okay. that in the uh, episode description too. Yeah. Um, dude, no, awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, that's the thing is like getting hooked on it and just slowly building it. It just takes time to grow yeah. your social media platform, but you'll get there. Thanks. Tell them about fishing with Charlie Nathan. Ooh. Oh, that's always fun. <laughs> Give us a story. Oh, which story? Well, tell them first what you're doing, and then tell them. Story. Like fishing with them, like with, okay. So fish, yeah, fishing with Charlie and Anthony. Well, for starters, I've been fishing Charlie's Derby for 14 years now, but we haven't really connected until this past year for some reason, which I always find it funny how you've been seeing the same guy for 14 years, mm -hmm. but you didn't get close so recently. And um, at the last Derby, he invited me to fish with him and Anthony in a club tournament. Cause up until then, by the way, I don't own a boat or anything. So all my fishing is done off the bank. So I was excited for a new experience. We fished it. And man, it was a wonderful time. I remember the first time out, Charlie taught me how to fish a Senko the proper way. Because <laughs> up until then, I fished Senkos in ponds. Had some decent luck, but man, it didn't beat fishing with Charlie with a Senko. And the second time out, Anthony taught me how to fish a horny toad. Also, heart racing. <laughs> Seeing the top wire explosions, that was something else. <laughs> Caught my first swim in a bass. It was great. And every single time I go out, I always learn something new. That's the fun part. So guys, give him a follow on his Instagram. Help this guy blow up so he can be like the next Kardashian online. Uh, <laughs> to get that that social media money. Um, Fishing now, Kardashian. Yeah, Charlie, thank you so much for coming out. This was a huge honor to get you out here to help promote. You know, not only that this this fantastic club, the new guys again, New Horizon Bass Anglers. You know, give them a follow. Link will be in the episode description. And also, like this this youth program has changed so many lives in this area. It's been a huge help to people that want to get involved in the outdoors, but they don't know where to go. Um, so, I mean, thank you for everything you do and thank you for your huge friend that's sat here off to the side. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, we gotta get you two on the show. We gotta do that sometime. Just have you two just tell stories for hours. I, I, yeah. I know we really do. That'll be the next show we'll do. That'll be a lot. And get Steve, Captain Steve Chaconis wanted to come in actually uh, one time. Yeah. Get three of us here. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I, you better, you can better I, block off five hours. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you one other story? Go for it. The worst and the best Ooh. at the same time yeah. clients I ever had. Oh died. my God. We're going to tell some shit about some people now. There we go. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman called me and asked me to take him smallmouth fishing. I said, sure, no problem. He said, I'd like to bring along my seven year old son and my five year old daughter. Is that okay? I said, sure. Happy to have him. I show up at the ramp, Edwards Ferry, to pick him up. And both the little girl and the son were there. One of them was holding a cooler, and the father was holding a bait bucket. And I said, what's in the bait bucket? He says, well, the boy and I, and when he said that, I looked at the boy, went out yesterday and caught 12, I lost it, Helgramites and a bunch of crawfish. What do you think of Helgramites? I said, I think they're the finest smallmouth bait in existence. He says, I knew you'd say that. That's why we went out and did it. And the look on the little boy's face was, he made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's fine. Well, we get in the boat and we take off and I head to my first spot, which is a deep hole in the, the river adjacent to the bank with some current in it. It always holds good sized smallmouth. There's also a ditch that runs parallel to the shoreline that's about two feet deeper than the area around it. 
Well, I anchored the boat and he pulls out his gear and gets ready to rig up. And I said, why don't I rig up rods for the kids and teach them to fish with artificial while you're fishing with your Helgramites? He said, that's fine. So he took out a Helgramite to put on the hook. And he threads the Helgramite on the hook and back and on the hook again and back and back and back. And then he takes a split shot about the size of a garden pea and puts it 12 inches above the Helgramite. And I said, sir, if I could offer, and he shut me up and said, Charlie, I've been fishing these since before you were born. Well, at that point, he and I were about the same age. Regardless, I figure there's no way I'm going to change his mind. So he cast out, and of course, the current sweeps the Helgramite under a rock, and that's where it's going to stay. There's no way he's ever going to get a bite. In the meantime, I put on our little DKB1 Bagley's on an ultralight for each of the kids and tell them how to cast and where to cast and so forth. Well, each of the kids has a limit of fish within an hour. <laughs> The little girl turns to me and she said, Charlie, uh, am I doing this right? I said, are you catching fish, honey? She said, yes. I said, you must be doing something right. <laughs> well, in this conversation, when she said, am I doing some, this right? Her father said, you're not reeling fast enough. When the boy asked me a question, the father replied, you're doing it wrong. Do it this way. Well, this went on and on. And the longer we sat there without him getting a bite, the more upset he got. The little girl obviously had seen this before. She said, Charlie, can I fish like my daddy? I said, sure, honey. So I took the bagley off, put a bobber and a hook on it with a small split shot, put a Helgramite on it, hooking it through the tail one time and dropping the bobber so that that Helgramite was drifting just slightly above the bottom. And I said, just drop it over the side and leave your bail open, which she did. And the bait's going out. She said, is it out far enough? And her father said, yes, close a bail. She said, is that right, Charlie? I said, well, a small mouth likes a bait moving. She says, oh, okay. And she left it open. And that bait hadn't gone another five feet when a three-pound smallmouth came out of the water with that helgramite in its mouth. When she got it in, we held it up, ooh and odd, released it. And I said, it's time to move to another spot. And he says, oh, yeah, well, this spot is completely worn out. I said, right. So we picked up the anchor, and I took him right back to Edwards Ferry and beach the boat. He said, what are we doing here? I said, I'm putting you ashore. <laughs> he said, why? I said, because I don't want you on my boat. He said, I bring people out here to teach them to fish and enjoy the outdoors. The only thing you're doing is yelling at your kids and causing them to hate the outdoors. And you're not going to do it on my boat. Now, I'll be happy to take the kids out and finish the day's fishing, but not with you along. He said, come on, kids, we're leaving. So they got their gear. He says, how much do I owe you? I said, you don't owe me anything. I haven't taught you anything. 
He leaves, yeah. gets yeah. back in his car, <laughs> and goes. Worst day I've ever had on the river. Three weeks later, I get a call. Charlie, this is so-and-so. Yes, sir. Do you remember me? Yes, sir. He said, I'd like to go fishing again. I said, have you learned your lesson? He said, I think so. Can my kids come along? I said, uh, I wouldn't fish with you without them. <laughs> <laughs> we make arrangements. I stop at Edwards Ferry to pick them up. They have a camera and a cooler. And they get aboard. And we go out to the first spot. I anchor. Little girl catches her fish. Everybody has to put their rod down. Little girl lands the fish. She holds it up. Oohs and ahs, takes pictures. She releases it. And that's the way the rest of the day went. Everybody. When someone hooked the fish, everybody else has to put their rod down. They land the fish, take a picture, release the fish. We caught a hundred fish that day. Wow. We go back to the ramp. The kids were laughing, giggling all day long. We just had an absolute marvelous time. Get back to the ramp. They load their stuff up. And our, the father said, what do I owe you, Charlie? Give you an idea how long ago this was. I said, well, my standard rate is $75. <laughs> he gives me an envelope. He said, well, here's your fee for today. And here's your fee for the last trip. And this is for the lesson. And he left. Over the balance of that summer, I saw he and his kids out in a John boat, probably three days a week for the rest of the summer. The following year, I haven't seen him since. But that was my best day on the river. I don't know how to top that one, so... Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, we're going to have to have you guys back. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Charlie, thank you. I mean, you are absolutely the man, the godfather of Northern Virginia, and I'm just That's happy. Great. Yeah, we're going to brand that. That's going to be on shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Told you. But yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Oh, gee. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough for coming in here and just reminding everyone what it what it should be like out there on the water. I hope it continues. One last thing. You're not going to shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason we've been fishing for 40 years. Because the story's never ended. Yeah. <laughs> the journey's not this over is, yet. This is not a story. It's a warning. When I started guiding and fishing, medical people didn't know a whole lot about sunlight. Right now... I'd like to warn everybody, sunscreen, hat, buff, and sunglasses. Without sunglasses, I fished for many years with a, an optician who told me that lack of sunglasses in bright sun will cause glaucoma. Not glaucoma. Cataracts. And I'm example. I've had both cataracts, both eyes with cataract surgery. This is a skin cancer. It's been there five years. I've already had 23 cut off because nobody knew anything about skin cancer back then. Please protect yourself from the sun. A little sunlight is good. A lot of sunlight is bad. That's, yeah. 
I mean, that's something as men we really don't think about. You know, you get injured, you keep playing. We don't think about longevity. And longevity is the key to like, everything. Yes. Stay healthy. It's all cumulative. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're younger. I, I, I've i broken my back. I've had four reconstructive shoulder surgeries. And, and you live like you're eight. You live like you're 18, but then you realize like that doesn't work as far as time keeps going on. <laughs> and my dermatologist <laughs> told me that some of my skin cancers mm -hmm. are as a result of being a lifeguard when I was 16 years old. So, yeah, I mean, that's and guys keep getting checked. I mean, I know like tactical bass and Matt Allen had a PSA on this when he had bad cancer on his face. But get yourself checked out. If something looks wrong, like make sure you get it taken care of now rather than waiting until it's too late. But yeah, again, Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. You're more than welcome to come on anytime, sir. I really appreciate it so much. Guys, like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.